Amen. All right. Well, if you want to take your Bibles now and turn to uh, 1 John chapter 5, we're starting a new chapter in 1 John. And I uh, I don't normally have an overhead for uh, a Wednesday night. I feel like I've been making overheads nonstop for the last eight weeks. But uh, I did one tonight because there's some things in our passage that are quite, uh, quite interesting. And as I'm moving in here, this is one of those passages where, uh, first, where John, very typically, is intertwining thoughts. And we've talked about his circular kind of uh, you know, outlining, how he'll approach a topic and he'll mention another topic along with it, and then he'll slide on over to another topic. Well, this is one of those uh, passages where you've got several different talk- topics sort of being talked about at once. And uh, one commentator uh, displays the unity of thought in this section with a chiastic outline. Now, I will explain what a chiastic outline is in a minute. I'm just going to show it to you. So here's 1 John uh, chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. And so you see how he has it organized. It's sort of like uh, on the uh, left-hand side, uh, it looks like over here on it looks like we have the uh, half of an X. And the letter key in Greek looks like an X. So that's where the chiastic comes from. So Bible scholars tend to find them. This is something that the Hebrews did. They would, they would at certain of their literature, this is one of their sort of the, the, the art form of their words. They would line up thoughts in a parallel structure but they would have an outside line of thoughts. And then it would, if you intend it in, you have another set of parallel thoughts and then a thought in the middle. And you can see that all those thoughts line up in this passage. Now, the only uh, qualification I have of this outline is he leaves verse 3 completely out. So I don't think that John himself was consciously creating a chiastic outline here. But I think that we can see, now I'm going to read this, and you think about this outline. I'm going to read the passage. But you think about this outline and uh, uh, see how those thoughts sort of lay down beside each other in this structure. And I think it's it's helpful for us to look at the whole passage this way and see at least this kind of an organization of the thoughts. It helps us to see that there are things being repeated in the passage. So I'm going to read verses 1 through 5. And by the way, this is interesting how my Bible here is laid out. Uh, Oh, I'm in the wrong chapter, that's right. Uh, How about if I get in the right chapter? But in in my Bible uh, here, there's a paragraph marker at verse 5. So it's a new paragraph. If you have a paragraph, a Bible that's arranged in paragraph format, you may that may be the way it is. So it seems a little bit odd. And then as I look at, uh, uh, I I think I've got a Bible somewhere where there's a paragraph marker at verse six. And so, and certainly, commentaries put these first five verses sometimes put these first five verses together in one section. So, and I think that's because. 1 John is so hard to outline. Like, where does the paragraph start? He is talking about ideas in verse 5 that he's been talking about here in these first four verses. But he's also starting to talk about an idea that he's going to talk about in the next couple of verses. So where is the paragraph? I'm not exactly sure. Okay? But we're going to sort of look at this as a unit to start with, and then I'm going to zero in on verse 1. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And whoever loves the father loves the child born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and observe his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is the one who overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus is the son of God? So, uh, that's the uh, passage, and you can see these parallel thoughts here. In verse 1, we have the one who believes that Jesus is the Christ, 
And then in verse 5, we have the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. So those seem to be parallel. It talks about that one in verse 1 being born of God. But also in verse uh, 4, it talks about everyone who is born of God. And then uh, verse 1 talks about those born of the Father. And... uh, and they, they love the children of God in verse 2. So there's a certain parallelism here. Okay, excuse me, they love those born of the Father, verse 1, love those, the children of God, in verse 2. So there's a certain parallelism, at least from a stu- uh, uh, studying standpoint, we can look at that and see those parallel thoughts. So we sort of know some topics we're going to be talking about as we look at this passage. Now, uh, <clears throat> when I was originally preparing this, when I started working, I've, got, I've been reading up on all five of these ver- first five verses and reading the commentaries and taking notes, and I thought, you know, I have to quit being so slow. I have to, I have to use, deal with a whole unit. And then I started trying to put together a message on the whole unit, and I thought, I was really having a hard time. So guess what? <laughs> it's verse 1. Okay, verse 1 tonight is what we're going to look at. And I actually, uh, for our title today, I called it The Logic of Christian Love. And uh, we are going to uh, focus just on this one verse. And we are transitioning. The previous passage from verse um, 13, uh, let's see, from verse 7 through verse 21 of the previous chapter was all about let us love one another and all of that discussion of love. Now, he's going to continue to talk about uh, love here in verse 1 and 2. And he's also going to mention it in verse 3. But then he's also going to introduce in verse 1, obedience. Or excuse me, verse 2, obedience, keeping, observing his commandments. And then in verse 3, the commandments. And in verse 4, uh, he's going to talk about the victory that overcomes the world. And, and then in verse 5, uh, he comes back to overcoming the world in faith. So you see, all of these thoughts, like he's, he's merging from love into these thoughts, victory and overcoming the world through obedience. So that's John, that's just the way he thinks. And so it's it, this, like I said, it's hard to outline. So I, I'm sort of forced into just this one verse, verse 1. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and whoever loves the Father loves the child born of him. So we're going to think about this sentence, and, uh, and I'll work on this proposition. At the foundation of overcoming the world is the relationship created with the new birth. At the foundation of overcoming the world is the relationship created with the new birth. I believe that verse 1 is going to lead us to verse 5. Verse 5 talks about overcoming the world. And verse 4 talks about overcoming the world. So here's the foundation, that relationship that's created with the new birth. But it's not merely a relationship with God. And that's what I think we'll see. Now, I'm not going to go through the whole outline here, but I do want you to look at, for point 1, I have laid out, first of all, the New American Standard and the King James, and then my own literal translation of this verse. All right, so here's the New American Standard. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and whoever loves the Father loves the child born of him. Here's the King James. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. You see, so there's a difference there. Now, here's my literal translation, and I, this is not really smooth, but it's trying, I'm trying to go word for word as we go from Greek to English. All the ones believing that Jesus is the Christ, out of God he has been begotten. And all the ones loving the one who has begotten also loves the one having been begotten out of him. All right, so now it is a little confusing when you listen to that. But the key thing to note here, uh, by the way, I should note here, I put in my notes, and you may see it there on the outline, 
The King James is actually more accurate here than the New American is. Now, the New American is usually has a reputation of being the most accurate, most literal translation. But in this verse, the King James is actually a little bit more accurate. The New American has an interpretation. Whoever loves the father loves the child born of him. But the word father is not in the text. Rather, what is in the text is... Uh, uh, that is everyone that loves him that begat, the one that begot. Well, who's the one that begat us? Well, that's the Father. So that's, in the New American, that's an interpretation. You follow what I'm saying? Does that make sense? Begotten is, or the begetter, is the Father. The more literal translation refers to him that begat. Okay? All right, now, that's that point. John is using the same verb throughout the sentence. First he uses it as a verb. Whoever, the, whoever believes, that Je, uh, believes in, that Jesus is the Christ has been begotten. All right? That's the verb. And then it's used as a participle. All the ones loving the one who has begotten. The one who has begotten is a participle. Also the loves the one having been begotten. That's a participle also. All right. So now we're going to try to make sense out of all this. The basic concept of this is that the new birth is the foundation of everything John is going to say in this section. That's the big thing to get. The reason I'm taking the time to point out this translational issue is so that you can see the, the multiple use of the word to beget. Okay? It's, it's in the first part of the sentence, and then it's in these two participles at the end of the sentence. And so that's important because he's using that same word throughout the verse. So we want to be talking about the idea of begetting or being born again. All right. So the ground of the new birth, the first thing we want to say, the ground of the new birth, belief in Jesus as the Christ. Notice how it's worded here. Whosoever, whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ. It's not whoever believes in Jesus Christ. It's whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ. And there's a difference. A lot of people believe in Jesus Christ. They believe Jesus existed. They believe that he was a, a historical person. They believe perhaps some of the facts about that person. But here's the issue. Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ? Well, first of all, the title Christ means Messiah. The Messiah is the long-promised deliverer of Israel, specifically, but also of the whole world, because as we read the prophecies in the Old Testament, we realize that God said, it's a light thing for you to deliver Israel. I will have you deliver the nations as well. I'm paraphrasing one of the prophecies when I say it that way. So for the Jews, this was a term that was vested with much meaning and hope. But in, in reality, for Gentiles, it's an unknown term. The Gentiles, Messiah or Christ doesn't mean anything. Christ and the Messiah are the same exact term. It means anointed one. It means they're referring to the same thing. All right? but, the, uh, but for Gentiles, this term is one that doesn't really resonate. They weren't looking forward to a Messiah. But what's interesting in history, you now there's been all kinds of experiments with kinds of government throughout history. But men tend towards one-man rule. Now, why is that? Now, there have been experiments with democracy, and I think actually, given the fallenness of man, democracy or a, or a republic or a dominion like we have in Canada does provide the most freedom for the people. I, I'm a fan of democracy. But democracy is really unusual in history around the world. If you think about world history, there, usually it's strong man rule. One man is ruling. Why is it that men tend to gravitate towards one-man rule? We say, well, somebody gets a lot of power and, and they uh, take over and beat everybody up who disagrees with them. Well, well, that's true. I've often said that the English kings were a bunch of thugs and they were the mafia that won. And I have all sorts of complimentary things to say about English kings. All right, but... The, that's one side of it. But the thing is that this is what people are looking for. People are looking for a man to rule them. If 
for a leader to rule them. I believe that even though the Gentiles do not know the term Messiah or Christ, they are looking for Christ. Not the Christ, but a Christ, if you'll follow what I'm saying. They're looking for a man. If you go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, the promise was made to Eve after the fall that the seed of the woman will bruise the head of the serpent. When she gets that boy, that first child, Cain, she says, behold, I've gotten a man from the Lord. She's looking for a man who's going to bruise the head of the serpent and solve the problems. I believe the world is looking for a man to solve their problems. All right? Now, the identification of Jesus as the Messiah means his coming has deep meaning. It's not a chance arrival. It's not just, you know, here was this guy and he just sort of showed up and he's, you know, sort of a random chance and this guy was so gifted and he, and that's what attracted people to him. Or it's not, as some people want to teach, a man who came into the world and he was just so, he was a mystic and he had a, he, he arrived at a higher level of spiritual consciousness and he's a man who's somehow superlative to other men in that way. No, it's not that at all. Rather, this is the one, when we say that Jesus is the Christ, that means he is the promised one. It's not an accident that he arrived when he arrived. If you believe in Jesus as the Christ, you are believing, that's shorthand for a whole host of theology of the Old Testament, or really Old Testament prophecy, that there is one coming who is going to be the Savior of his people. So when you believe in Jesus as the Christ, you are believing in in, uh, the divine Son of God who was sent to save men from their sins. That's what you're believing. Now there's a whole lot of theology wrapped up in that phrase. Simply believing that Jesus is the Christ. uh, uh, Becomes shorthand for that whole body of theology. In other words, as I put in the notes, it's, it's more than just an intellectual decision. Jesus is sent to the earth as the deliverer of mankind, and to believe in him is to accept his deliverance, to accept it on his terms, and to surrender to his lordship. Now he, he is, when we accept him as the Messiah or as the Christ, he is the one to whom every knee should bow, and we are to follow him. It says, whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ. All right? One commentator, this, or this is actually the ESV Study Bible, says this. The word that underscores that saving faith has a particular content. It is not a vague religious commitment, but a wholehearted trust in the saving work of Christ. And I think that's an accurate statement. So here's the content of our faith. Jesus is the Christ. This is what we believe. Now, what that means is, if, if uh, who is, uh, how should I say this? I'm trying to say two points at once. It's not coming out very well. I'm stuttering. All right, let me just say this. There's the content of our faith. Jesus is the Christ. If you believe that, the verse says, you're born of God. That's the new birth. That's being born again, as Jesus said in John chapter 3. Well, notice the first word, though, whoever, whoever. My literal translation, all the ones believing. Everyone believing, all right? The the new birth is open to everyone who believes, which equals the whosoever in the, or whoever in the New American Standard, whosoever in the King James. There is no limit on everyone here. In, In essence, anyone anyone in the world can believe this. But what he's particularly focusing on is anyone who does believe this is born of God. Right? So that's the very first step in what he's trying to say in this verse. Now, there's interesting, his, his sentence is progressing along here, but notice, whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God And then he turns it around a little bit and he says, whoever loves the Father, or the King James, whoever loves him that begat. Now, wait a minute, I thought we were talking about believing. Now he's talking about loving. Now there's some verses that, uh, that that 
ran through my mind as I, uh, I thought about this particular concept. And I, added a, I did a search in my Bible program and I found a couple others. But here's the basic point. You can't believe without love for God. Right? It's, it's impossible. It's impossible to love God and not believe what God has said. And it's impossible to believe that Jesus is the Christ without loving God. So whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is also the same as the person who loves God, who loves the one who begat. So let's look at a couple of verses that confirm the connection of love and faith. So for example, Galatians 5, Christ. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything, but faith working through love. Faith working through love. Here's, there's a connection in the New Testament between faith and love. Uh, love for God, belief in Jesus Christ, it's all part of one package. 1 Peter 1.8 says, Though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, you believe in him. Excuse me, but believe in him. You greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. So here Peter makes a connection between faith and and love. And then 1 John 4.16, which we read a couple weeks ago. We have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love. And the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. And so uh, the three great apostles, Paul, Peter, and John, are all connecting the idea of faith and love in the New Testament. And so my point is you can't believe without love for God. And the believer is then the one who is in view in this verse. He's the one who's born again. He's the one who's begotten by the begetter. The believer loves the Father, or him that begat, according to the King James. And faith produces love for the one who provided life. Faith works by love for the one who gave the Son. So all of this, there's a connection, an equivalence of faith with love for God. The last thing I want to say then is what is the fruit of faith in God's household? So the language of begetting, as we've noted, dominates this verse. So the believer is begotten, the believer loves the begetter, and then the last thing that said, the believer of necessity must love the one begotten. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Whoever loves the father loves the child born of him. Now remember, way back there in 1 John 4, 7, it says, Beloved, let us love one another. And you know, when we look at our uh, body of believers, there are people who we have met through our church, who are people that come from walks of life we would never otherwise have met. Now, what happens in this relationship? Well, if they are believers, if each one of us are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are begotten of the, of the begetter, all right? So we're all born again. We're all begotten of the begetter. Well, if we are all begotten of the same father, we have a natural spiritual love for one another. And so when he says, beloved, let us love one another, this is something that should be of course. Of course. Now, we have a tendency, because we all have sin natures, we have a tendency to sort of irritate one another. My wife and I, for the last couple of days, for some reason, one of her old roommates came up. And we were talking today, actually, about her. And uh, I said, my impression of her was that she was kind of prickly. And Debbie sort of agreed with me. <laughs> a little bit hard to get along with. Oh, I remember, we were talking about a, another friend of ours who apparently had dated her for a while when she uh, was Debbie's roommate, and that's the connection. And then he did not, he married somebody else. He didn't, he didn't stick with her. <laughs> I said, my impression was she was kind of prickly, and I don't remember how I knew this girl. Uh, somehow she was in the same class as me, and so maybe we sat reasonably close together in some classes. I don't know. Anyway, uh, I didn't really know her that well. I just had that sense. Well, that's true of some Christians. They're kind of prickly. But if they're born again, uh, born again, there is a natural instinct among us to love one another. 
And even if we're a little bit hard to love, or if the other person's hard to love, there's still a heart that is part of this household. We're part of this household of God. So there are, there are images in the Bible about the church. It's Christ's building, or Christ's body, or God's building. Those are some of the images that are used. But here it's sort of the household. God is the father. Believers are his children. We hold a family relationship in God's household. Now, when a home, when a human home functions properly, the natural relationships in the home mirror this picture. So we're talking about a properly functioning home. And I know there are homes that are broken and there's lots of problems. We're not talking about that. But we're talking about a home where there's a natural, uh, properly functioning relationship. Husband and, love are loving, uh, husband, husband and wife are loving one another and they produce children. And you know when you have that baby... You know, nobody has to say, okay, now I need to teach you how to love this baby. Nobody. I mean, and you think, I don't, I don't know. I mean, everybody thinks it's natural to love their children. You know, and I like little kids, and I enjoy all the little kids that come into the church. But, you know, and, and I would have to say, I love the little ch- kids that come to our church. But, you know, if my grandchildren would show up at this church, it would be different. Because there's, all, there's a natural, it's just a natural love. I was thinking about this, and there's a natural love between siblings, although I know siblings fight because they have sin natures, but that's not what I'm talking about. I was thinking about this in respect, uh, our daughter-in-law puts out or produces a calendar, uh, sort of very self-focused, uh, uh, <laughs> I shouldn't say self-focused, but it's focused on her family, which we all love, and we want to see pictures of them. So she makes pictures of them for us for every month of the year. And I think it was either this month or last month, there's a picture of our granddaughter holding her brother when he was born. And you should see that look on her face. She's just so pleased to be holding that little boy. Now, I'm sure there's times today she's not so pleased with him. All right? Okay? She's not so pleased with him. But... There is a natural bond of love between those two kids. Even though, because they're sinners, they will pick at each other and cause problems with one another. Even so. Well, why do you care? Like you've got family members, brothers and sisters and so on, whom you care about and they're suffering. Now there's plenty of people in the world who suffer the same way, but you don't, I I mean, you care in a sense, but you don't care, right? You follow what I'm saying? Because of that bond. And this is what I'm saying about the Christian family. We have a bond of love that is natural in this household. And so my proposition at the foundation of overcoming the world is the relationship created with the new birth. So we're going to get to overcoming the world here in this passage. But here at the foundation is this relationship. What I want to say and what I'm really, this message is really getting to is, if you want to overcome the world, you really need the church. You really need the body of Christ. It's not a matter of, you know, uh, what is the army, U.S. Army had a slogan, an army of one. They were advertising this, this promoting the individualism amongst, uh, in our current culture, the recruiting posters, an army of one, you know. And you're going to be it. You're the Mr. Tough Guy, whatever. Uh, Well, that's not the way Christians work. It's not an army of one. It's a body. It's God's household. And this is how we overcome the world. It is through a healthy Christian life, which lives as part of a body. That's how the world's overcome. In us and around us in all kinds of ways. Well, we've got lots more to say here. My time is done, but let's just close with a word of prayer. I hope that really encourages you tonight. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time that we've had to consider your word, and I pray that it's, as we think about it, and we think about the value of your body, of your household, that makes us uh, uh, connected spiritually with one another, that we would be full of love for you, for our brothers and sisters, and that we would be strengthened in the inner man so that as we live out this life, 
that we can indeed overcome the world in ourselves. And as we witness and proclaim the word of God in the world around us, we can be victorious. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.